Good evening. I'm David Common. Ian is away. Tonight, coronavirus surges to an all-time high in the U.S. Clearly, we opened up too fast, too soon. As several states do a 180 to mitigate the damage, Canadians watch nervously. What's going on next door can creep through the borders. An infectious disease specialist on what those spiraling U.S. numbers mean for this country. Canada's biggest airlines are resuming normal seating, as in filling all those seats. We're told to keep maintaining uh, social distancing as much as we can. And here you have airlines that are still wanting to pack people in, like sardines. Some travelers aren't so sure about it either. And Toronto was supposed to look like this today before coronavirus. The Pride Parade goes online with a message of protest and progress. This is The National. After months of global efforts to contain COVID-19, the deadly virus continues to spread, threatening the fragile progress made so far. And today, there are new markers of a grim trajectory in the U.S. and a brutal indicator of the damage done around the world. 109 days into the pandemic, a new milestone today, 10 million recorded cases, over half a million of them fatal. Here in Canada, we're clearly flattening the curve, as our other countries even harder hit. Italy, the UK, Spain, once overwhelmed, now though through the worst of it. But in the United States, things are going in the wrong direction. Tina Lovegreen begins our coverage tonight with a look at how bad it's become. Just weeks after they reopened, they were forced to shut down. We did everything. We, our staff were wearing masks. We, we had uh, sanitizing stations. We did weekly tests. But all bars in Florida now banned from selling alcohol after a record spike in cases. On Sunday, 8,500 new confirmed infections. The day before, over 9,500, shattering previous single-day totals. Young adults blamed for ignoring physical distancing and told to stay home. Miami's famous beaches closed for the 4th of July weekend. Anyone not wearing a mask will be fined. We need our residents to cooperate with us. We're asking them to please help us. The surge of cases most pronounced in a handful of southern and western states that reopened earlier and more aggressively, despite warnings by health officials to wait. Clearly we opened up too fast, too soon. In my district in the Rio Grande Valley, we had a 700% increase in just the last 30 days. Just days after touting optimism about the U.S.'s response to the pandemic, Vice President Mike Pence canceled rallies in Florida and Arizona due to a surge in numbers. Though still attended a scheduled rally at a Dallas church, trying to keep the faith. We'll see our way through these challenging times. We will restore our nation's health. We will renew our freedom. Yeah! A message taken a little too soon in Arizona this weekend as the U.S. continues on a dark trajectory with the highest known death toll of any country in the world. What's going on next door can creep through the borders. We have to be very vigilant about travel and very vigilant about border cro crossings. As America gears up to celebrate its 244th birthday, still very much in grips of a crisis. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Of course, the border is largely closed, but Canadians may be understandably worried by what they're seeing south of the border. And so we've got Dr. Isaac Bogosh uh, with us right now. Dr. Bogosh, should we as Canadians really be concerned about what's happening south of the border? Absolutely. Uh, we know that things are getting worse in many parts of the United States. This infection is taking off in many of the southern states, but it's certainly affecting uh, other states as well. And if, given that we share a, a huge land border with them, we have to be very concerned that if this border is ever opened, we'll re-import cases into Canada and undo a lot of the hard work that we've done in Canada in getting this infection under control here. Yeah, you say it's under control, and yet we hear about 10 million cases worldwide. It does seem, in spite of the progress happening here, that things are kind of getting worse and not better worldwide. Yeah, sadly, that's the case. Uh, things are really getting worse and worse on a global standpoint. And that's largely related to either poor, poor policy and poor planning or not implementing the policy. And of course, sadly, we know some places just don't have the capacity 
to manage cases such as other high income countries. So I think that's those are the main reasons why this is getting worse on a global scale. Well, something for us certainly to watch out for. Dr. Isaac Bogoch, thanks very much. Anytime. Well, if you like the idea of flying next to an empty middle seat, too bad because Canada's two largest airlines have announced they're ending physical distancing on planes. That's as of July 1st. And as Ashley Burke explains, that's making some customers uncomfortable. I'm just going to take your temperature, if you don't mind. Flying during a pandemic comes with a host of new safety measures, but one is about to end, blocking off middle seats. We both feel pretty uneasy about it. Sarah Antonio and her husband booked a six-hour flight from Toronto to Vancouver. It's for a crucial business trip next month. They only booked it because WestJet's website assured them the middle seat would be empty. So we took some comfort in this option and see, seeing that me and my husband are from the same household, we thought, oh, that's great. We're just going to have a row to ourselves. I'll take the window, you take the aisle, and we'll have a whole row. But WestJet and Air Canada announced Friday that they're ending the practice on July 1st, a move in line with other airlines, including Flair. The carriers say new cleaning protocols, air filtration systems, mandatory mask wearing, and temperature checks make the risk of transmitting COVID-19 low. Well, the cost of blocking off middle seats is high, but it's a move that could backfire with customers. For some passengers, it is a big deal, and they will, in fact, move their travel arrangements to other airlines that do offer that middle seat or will delay their, tra their, delay their travel. Transport Canada has recommended that airlines physically distance when possible to prevent the spread of COVID-19, but it's not mandatory. You must wear the face mask at all times during the boarding process. Doctors say even though it is safer to fly now, it isn't risk-free. We now know that being near somebody for longer periods of time, uh, that increases your risk, even in an office setting, for example. So therefore, the shorter flights, less risky, uh, whereas the longer flights, you may have a chance of breathing in the virus. Air Canada says the adjacent seat policy was meant to be a temporary measure. And like WestJet, it's counting on its new protocols to keep passengers safe. Meanwhile, many customers are still angry that they haven't been refunded for flights cancelled due to COVID-19. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. An update now on the COVID-19 outbreak connected to a Kingston, Ontario nail salon. The city's chief medical officer now reports 21 confirmed cases, but says it could have been much worse. If we hadn't caught this early, yes, we could have had widespread activity amongst vulnerable members of our community. Hundreds of residents voluntarily went to Kingston's mobile testing site again today. The outbreak was declared last Thursday, less than two weeks after Kingston moved into stage two of its reopening. A few hundred kilometers west in the heart of Ontario's farming country, COVID-19 remains a much greater danger. Outbreaks among migrant farm workers have now killed at least three people. The most recent victim was laid to rest just today. Talia Ricci looks at the growing anger over the situation. Juan Lopez Chaparro's memorial mass was streamed online today so his family in Mexico could take part. The father of four died of COVID-19 working on a farm in southwestern Ontario. We know that he came here to work and uh, to build a better life for his children. But now they will not be seeing their father again. He's the third migrant worker in Ontario to die from the virus and one of hundreds who have been infected. On the same day as the service, dozens took to the streets in Leamington, demanding better protection for workers. Migrant rights are human rights. The situation is bad enough that Leamington and Kingsville are still effectively locked down. The group says a lot of the crisis has to do with living conditions. You can test as many workers as you want to test, but it's not going to stop the virus from spreading like wildfire when they live like 10 to 20 men to one house. Last week, Premier Doug Ford promised more testing and resources for migrant workers, saying their jobs are safe. I want to send a clear message to the temporary workers. No one will lose their job if you have COVID-19. At Nature Fresh Farms, more than 30 temporary workers have tested positive for COVID. But the president and CEO there says only a couple are showing symptoms. We have a really good plan now. Um, it'll be, people will be isolating. Believe me, the, the farming industry does not want the rest of the county to suffer. 
But protesters say the virus is simply shining a brighter spotlight on issues that have existed for years. We want to get to the underlying issues that have existed for decades now. Advocates hoping this is the last funeral under these circumstances. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Leamington, Ontario. To other news now, American intelligence believes U.S. soldiers were killed in Afghanistan after Russia offered bounties to the Taliban. That according to the Washington Post. Donald Trump denies knowing anything about the financial reward, but his former national security advisor and now critic John Bolton isn't buying it. His fundamental focus is, is not the security of our forces, but whether he looks like he wasn't paying attention. So he's saying, well, nobody told me, therefore you can't blame me. The New York Times reports that the president was briefed months ago. Both the Taliban and Russia's foreign ministry deny the story, while Trump rival Joe Biden says if there's any truth to it, the lack of action is shocking. Even a Republican senator was shocked by a Trump retweet this morning featuring video of a supporter yelling out white power. It came during the latest weekend of protest against anti-black racism. Paul Hunter has the White House reaction. Listen carefully to the man in the blue t-shirt. White, 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 white power, a rallying cry for white nationalists shouted by an apparent supporter of Donald Trump in an angry back and forth with those who oppose the president. But it was Trump himself who today took it to another level, retweeting that video, thanking his supporters in it, until when criticized, the tweet was deleted. Says the White House, Trump never heard the part about white power. No justice! No peace! This weekend, amid more pressure for social justice for black Americans, and as legislators in Mississippi acted to now remove the Confederate symbol from its state flag, pushback against the video Trump Listen, retweeted, I mean, if you, if you including the from the only black Republican in the U.S. Senate. The entire thing was offensive. Certainly the comment about the white power was offensive. Trump's health secretary, Alex Azar, framed it this way. Neither the president, his administration, nor I would do anything to be supportive of white supremacy uh, or anything that would, uh, that would support discrimination of any kind. Hey, stop right there. Meanwhile, stop. another stop. police video has moved stop. into the spotlight. Stop. I have a right to stop you because you're being suspicious. From last year, and a young black man, Elijah McClain, walking home from a corner store in Colorado, wearing a mask, is stopped by police. I'm going home. Relax or I'm going to have to change this situation. McLean seems perplexed and afraid. He appears to struggle. Police use a chokehold. Paramedics sedate him with a needle. He died a week later. Police at the time were cleared of any wrongdoing, but as the U.S. now reckons with its racial divide, there's renewed anger and fresh demands for justice. The officers involved are being reinvestigated. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. A man has been charged with murder after a deadly shooting at a protest in Kentucky. We can't let this one senseless act of violence slow or halt what the peaceful protesters are demanding in our city. It happened at a protest against the police shooting death of Breonna Taylor last night. One protester was killed, another injured. The suspect had been asked to leave the area earlier in the day for being disruptive. Racist incidents are also coming to light in this country. In Toronto, for the third time this month, a noose was found at a construction site. Um, it, unfortunate, it's very sad. Some human beings, this, they, they think it's funny, and, and this is cool, and this, this makes them proud. Uh, this is not human. A Toronto community group held this demonstration to speak out against the use of that hateful symbol. Very frankly, it shook me to my core. Um, I, I, I was in tears. Toronto police have made an arrest after a hospital worker says she was verbally accosted on the subway Friday. She says the woman then took her young daughter's marker to write a racial slur on the wall. That suspect now faces two charges involving mischief to property and harassment. Meanwhile, a black Vancouver bus driver says a passenger told him to hang himself this week with this piece of rope left on the bus. Nine black police officers in Montreal are now breaking ranks to declare that there is systemic racism in their force. Simon Nakonechny shows us why. 
It's a bold statement in a culture known for silence. Nine black Montreal police officers calling out their union president for downplaying systemic racism in the force. This former RCMP officer speaks on behalf of the group called the SPVM9. When you have a deficient system, this allows for the bad apples not only to flourish, but also infect others and even get promoted through the system. For years, Montreal's black community says they've been the target of racial profiling, sometimes with lethal consequences. Names like Anthony Griffin, Pierre Coriolan and Nicholas Gibbs still loom large. But in interviews that followed the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Union President Yves Franca warned against drawing parallels. On Friday, responding to the black officer's letter, Franca defended his position, saying the word systemic suggests all officers are implicated in a deliberately racist system. Debate over the word is not new to the province. The premier has repeatedly yeah, denied right. systemic racism yes, exists in Quebec. I think that there is some discrimination in Quebec, but there's no systemic discrimination. That sentiment had been echoed by the city's police brass, but the chief changed his message after a scathing public consultation and report. Valorama Holness helped force those consultations. The former Montreal Alouette's cornerback says there's plenty of proof racial profiling exists. We know it's true. Last year, a report came out that established that black and indigenous people were four to five times more likely to be carted by the SPVM. The union president says his door is open if the black officers want to discuss this important challenge. We'll see how far that will go if they can't even agree on what systemic racism means. Simon Akineshny, CBC News, Montreal. The Edmonton Eskimos have released a wide receiver over a homophobic tweet. He sent it out yesterday, the same day as many Pride celebrations. Christian Jones tweeted out his opposition to gay and lesbian relationships. It was quickly condemned as hateful, and the team released him today. The CFL also issued a statement saying there is no place in the league for commentary like that. Jones has since apologized. Habitat for Humanity is criticizing its Edmonton chapter because 57 families who signed up for an affordable path to home ownership are now in court fighting eviction. It's because the cash-strapped local chapter changed the terms of their deal. Rafi Bujikanian spoke to low-income tenants feeling desperate. Iftu Amin and her family were not expecting to pack boxes this summer. The program is good for us, no down payment, no interest. That program is part of this housing project for low-income families. The idea, volunteer 500 hours of your time with Habitat for Humanity in exchange for tenancy and eventually interest-free homeownership. But last fall, Habitat Edmonton changed their agreement, saying families would be charged a split mortgage, one of which would be interest-free and the other with interest. The charity said it was heavily in debt and this was a matter of survival. We probably won't be here longer than three years. If I approve for the housing from the bank, I won't apply, I won't apply Habitat. Now, Habitat International says Edmonton should not have changed the agreement. It asked them to find an independent mediator and delay further actions with the families. We're hopeful that Habitat will heed the advice of the uh, Habitat International. This lawyer has been working with nearly 60 tenants hoping to launch a class action lawsuit. He recently lost an injunction to delay the removal of tenants who don't sign the new agreement. Habitat annual reports show the judge in that case made two donations to Habitat Edmonton over the last two years. This watchdog says that's a concern. The old saying is justice has to be not only done, but seen to be done. And that means it has to appear that it's an uh, impartial court. In a statement, the court said it could not comment on ongoing proceedings. Habitat Edmonton has denied any conflict of interest, saying it wasn't aware of the donations. It is now saying it's open to discussing mediation with the families. COVID is around everywhere. If we, we end up in the shelter, maybe all my kids get sick, I get sick. Without mediation, the tenants who refuse the new mortgage model could face eviction by the end of July. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. 
With COVID-19 cases climbing around the world, hitting new milestones, tonight, a success story. We are living with coronavirus. Next on The National, no lockdown, limited testing. So how did Japan manage to flatten the curve so quickly? So uh, nice to see you there. And Adrian checks in with our reporters in the field the challenges and surprises of covering a pandemic. But it was so raw, Adrian. Like, she could see my eyes, I could see her eyes. And Canada's biggest pride parade goes virtual. <laughs> We're back in just a moment. India reported more than 19,000 new COVID-19 cases today, its highest daily jump. The situation has prompted health authorities there to open up one of the world's largest hospitals. Stores and hair salons reopened this weekend in Rio de Janeiro, despite Brazil reporting an additional 30,000 infections just today and making it the second worst hit country after the U.S. Japan saw its highest daily number of COVID cases today since early May, with 99 new infections reported, many of which can be traced back to bars or nightclubs in Tokyo. Still, Japan has been seen as a coronavirus success story, even after facing an early threat of the virus and criticism over its handling of the Diamond Princess quarantine, the country has managed to keep its epidemic under control, and it's done so without imposing lockdowns. Sasha Petrasik explains. For two months, Koichi Sei played music in his Tokyo bar, with no one to listen to it. The bar was closed, not because of any official order, just government advice, and he says, duty to his customers. It's a gamble, it's a gamble. Yeah, we don't know, we, we are not sure, so we cannot gamble our life. Driven by social responsibility instead of harsh penalties, so far Japan seems to have dodged the worst of the pandemic. Even with a population three times Canada's, the death toll is less than an eighth, fewer than a thousand. This despite delayed border closings, limited testing and no lockdown. Unlike Westerners, we're used to wearing masks, says Kawai Ryukin. Avoid the three C's, says Tetsu Shinyu. No closed spaces, no crowds, and no close contact. And you don't have to worry. No more fear of visiting reopened attractions, like Tokyo's Observation Tower, or going out to stores and restaurants, where it's almost business as usual. Indeed, the Prime Minister's main fear now is that Japan won't reopen quickly enough. We need to control infections with as few restrictions as possible, says Shinzo Abe, to protect our livelihoods. Since Japan realizes it can't kill the virus, it's decided to focus on containing it. So from the beginning, we have the sort of an understanding that we are living with coronavirus. Another key element is targeted contact tracing instead of mass testing through some 800 local health centers across the country. Meanwhile, in Japan's stadiums, cheerleaders lead empty stands and players play only for the cameras. It's the picture of living with the pandemic. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Next, our team of reporters reflect on covering these unprecedented times. When it changed, everything changed. Like everything stopped. From the pandemic to the protests, the storytelling challenges and the moments that stick with them. But first, as we go to break. Pride looked different around the world this year, including in Toronto today, where the country's largest parade was moved online for the first time because of COVID-19. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Pride. The usual rainbow floats were replaced with Zoom dance parties and DJs without a crowd. <laughs> a new normal for Pride, but with the enduring message. It means family and um, 
you know, there's a lot of work still to be done. A chance for the LGBTQ community to come together, to be seen and heard during a global pandemic. All aboard, like it's some parade. And a moment of reckoning against anti-black racism. No one group has to carry the burden of injustice on their own. That message also echoed offline at a no pride in policing rally in front of Toronto's City Hall, calling for cuts to the city's police budget. This Pride Month ended with a return to its protest roots. Hi there, my name is Kim Fluxgold and I live in Vaughan, Ontario. During the past six weeks, I've been working on an initiative because I wanted to do something special for the class of 2020 graduates. So I came up with an idea of making lawn signs to honor them. And uh, all of the proceeds go to Kids Help Phone. Everything the kids have been working for is being taken away, their rites of passage included. Many are feeling very anxious, disappointment, depressed. Thank you so much. And I felt like the kids' help phone was made for this pandemic because they can be reached by phone, by text, by and online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I've been delivering and installing close to 700 signs at this point. Here you go. My goal uh, when I first began this about six weeks ago was to raise a few thousand dollars, um, but I actually ended up raising uh, probably a bit over 10,000 at this point. Yay! The outpouring of support and kindness that I've received have truly made this the most uh, rewarding success ever. It's pretty amazing. Well, these past few months have been unprecedented for everyone. And as journalists, we've had to adapt how we tell stories, where we can go, where we can't. But the pace of news has also been historic, from a global pandemic to a global movement. So Adrian asked some of us to share what it's been like to report on this moment. There we go. Oh, you're quite handy with that chair. <laughs> See, we're rolling. I will fine tune the light. That's fine in the shot. You are. Still life in the British capital. The UK trying to slow itself down and bringing with it a sense of distortion. Difficult for people to get used to. All right, are we good? Everybody happy? That's good. That's good. That's good. That's fine. All right, here we go. So uh, nice to see you there. Um, can you talk to people about what your London w was like before the pandemic and then in, in the week since? I think that's been one of the, the weirdest things about London. And when, it, when they all of a sudden overnight became empty, it, it felt really distorted and alienating. And, and I remember being in the center of town in the early days and, and you just felt like it was like a city hollowed out. <laughs> remarkable in the suddenness um, and I suppose highlighted by the contrast of what Washington was like before. It's a sidewalk culture town, everybody walks, everybody goes outside, but when it changed, everything changed. Like everything stopped uh, with no warning. You know, we're not really supposed to go into people's houses. We're not really supposed to go into people's offices anymore. And the whole idea of, of this industry is based on human contact in, in, to, to no small degree. I mean, I'm talking now into a computer that's stacked on top of four books, you know, in a, in a, in a sterile studio somewhere. That's not the way you talk to people, but it is the way we talk to people now. And you lose something in that. And I want to go back in for my dad, but I'm worried for myself and my son. Kelly Shillard is staying in as a precaution after tending to her 81-year-old father who lives at the Lynn Valley Care Centre. It looked nerve-wracking, it was sad, it was so strange to see you talking to people behind glass. Can you walk me through like what discussions you had to have as a crew and with the people you were talking to in those early days? So it was about figuring out what can we do and um, I remember we showed up at, the, at her door, Kelly Shellard's door, and I was like, do you have a window? But there are a lot of people that have nobody in there. 
And that's what I'm the most worried about. I'm sorry. It was strange and, um, but it was so raw, Adrian. Like she could see my eyes, I could see her eyes. And even though we were, you know, not in the same room that we, there was the glass barrier between us, like I was holding on to every word and, and, and I think we still had that connection and, and trying to understand what she was going through that to me didn't feel worlds apart, even if it looked physically worlds apart. The hardest part is walking away from a conversation without shaking someone's hand, without being able to, you know, put a hand on their shoulder. And then we just, you just have to get in your car and drive away. And I think that was the hardest part where I was just like, one day I'll be back and one day we'll be able to, you know, shake each other's hand, hug each other. That's the strangest part. It relieves the boredom, hey, when we're all locked down like this. Are you the Canadian, the Canadian lady? I'm the Canadian. It was a completely beautiful thing to see him standing there. You know, he was someone who, obviously, because of his age, we were very careful. He was 97. And so we were masked and approached with trepidation and care. That's the Rifle Brigade, 1942. And was just so full of good cheer. And he admitted that he had a hard time being alone. And, um, you know, I asked him, what do you do to, to cheer yourself up? And he said, well, I like to sing. We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know where. He was a special man, and I, I think um, he, he was a real optimist. I think, like them all, they remind us of what, you know, what terrible things humanity is capable of and what great courage as well. Oh, won't you please say hello to the folks that I know. The dozens of dead at Orchard Villa can no longer be saved, but there remain questions about whether they might have lived. Long-term care has long been neglected. Um, it's abundantly clear to me that many care homes were already on the edge of a cliff and COVID came along and pushed it right off. We, we started to see, uh, you know, it, it's a tricky question because you actually weren't seeing it. And the reason you weren't seeing it is these homes were locking down. They weren't letting outsiders in, but it was trickle, trickle, trickle bits of information. And then it got to, well, we've had a death. And then that started to arc up, up, up. And then you had, you know, 30 people dead, then 50, and then it starts rapidly getting into the three digits. And then we pass a thousand people dead across Canada in long-term care. That is a common theme for families gathering outside Orchard Villa, calling out the names of the lost. Ruth Kramer. Jack Farron. Mary Walsh. Angela Skrillis. I have found it frustrating at times that um, action on things we knew were problematic as a society, that that action wasn't taken sooner, before the pandemic. We could have created the conditions that made this much more survivable in long-term care, but we chose as a society not to. And it wasn't just about COVID. Um, we have made the final days, months, years of your life much less dignified. We have made them much more difficult. We've warehoused our elderly. I find that very frustrating. In New York is where Stephen D'Souza is right now. And Stephen, what's going on? Uh, Ian, for those viewers who've been watching us throughout the night, we were earlier with the group that was uh, playing a bit of a cat and mouse game, marching through the street. We came back on the second night of the of the protests, and I describe it in the way that you know you've seen disaster movies where there's fires burning in the city, uh, helicopters flying overhead, riots in the streets, and people are in front of their house, frantically packing a minivan to drive away and to get out of there. We were doing the opposite. We were arriving in the minivan to that scene because that's what was happening in New York that night. The, the emotion and the anger, 
I think is tied so much to the pandemic because you know people were in their homes for almost two months mm -hmm. and they were seeing some of the violence happening in other places, the shooting of Ahmed Arbery and, you know, and you know, what happened to George Floyd, but they also saw the impact of the virus on their communities. And I'm talking about like, you know, the African-American community, the Hispanic community. They saw lower income neighborhoods hit harder by this. Hang on a second, Ian. Bear with me. So what's happening is just down that street. They're coming this way. We're going to have to go around this way. So what's happening, Ian? Police are trying to clear the area. There we go, right there. It is a revolution that's happening. And, and it, it is imperative not to go there, not to tell those stories. You know, the question has been asked, why this, why now? Uh, for these demonstrations. And we can talk about the sort of the visceralness of that video, um, huge factor. We can talk about three years into the presidency of Donald Trump, uh, no small factor. We can talk about a litany of other examples uh, of the kind of thing that happened in Minneapolis. And then to that comes COVID, in fact, police are coming this way now, so we should probably move on. It's orderly, Ian. Uh, it's by and large, I've said this many times tonight, peaceful. But they're getting hepped up by the minute. In this demonstration, in this week, in these days of it, I'm telling you, it felt different. Black Lives Matter! It felt like a critical mass had been reached, that, that this isn't going to go away. So as a dad and a reporter, how would you explain this to your kids? Uh, my 18-month-old son can say the word helicopter really well now because it's flying over our head every night. Um, my daughter, it's, she's five years old, and so you know she really is coming to understand what's going on. And so we exp we've explained to her about race and how people see others differently and judge them based on the color of their skin. What is your message? What do you want people to know? This is more about George Floyd, though. Yeah, it? we're doing this for the future. We're doing this for the people who didn't make it and for everybody to have the right to exist in this country as equal people. Is there something that gives currency to the idea that maybe this time it's different? The one thing you know you can say for sure is that people are energized and people feel that they are in a moment. You know, we talked to people lining the route uh, for George Floyd's funeral procession. The last mile was in a horse-drawn carriage and people were waiting for hours in the 100 degree Texas heat. And you know, a 16 year old girl told us, this was our, this is me, I wanna be here because this is a moment in history. Like this whole situation is changing the world and I'm just glad that we can be out here and be a part of it. It is so powerful. It's there. It's this giant term that means so much to so many that might bring change right there, right in front of the White House, right in front of that church where so much has happened. And people are standing around it and looking at it and taking pictures and taking selfies of themselves near it. It's just a symbol. But what a symbol. Right? And people were climbing up on mailboxes to get up close to it. And again, so their people down below could take pictures of them near it. Like it changed the whole vibe. Everybody felt, okay, this, does, this isn't going to change our lives. But it changes something. We will be right back with a much different story lurking underground. Why are parts of California literally sinking and what it could mean for the food on your table? In California, they talk about the mega drought. For two decades, dry, hot conditions have cooked parts of the state to a crisp. The problem is especially dire for the state's farms. Take a look at the coming summer. The darker color punctuates the expected lack of precipitation. And the way many California farms get their water has a pretty radical impact. As Kim Brunhuber showed us earlier this season, a large part of the state is sinking. Mm. It's very good. When you walk through Jeannie Williams' sunny orchard, you don't notice anything wrong, but the problem's there, underfoot. The land around her, about 250 square kilometers, is sinking. 
We get everything from the well, and I know that the water is clean. We don't have problems with E. coli and things like that because um, our, you know, it comes straight from the ground. Her well is small and shallow, but this is California's Central Valley, which produces about a quarter of America's food supply and a large part of the $3.5 billion worth of produce that California exports to Canada. For more than a century, farmers have been pumping water out of the ground, so much so the land around here is slowly sinking, a process known as subsidence. In less than 100 years, it's dropped eight and a half meters. That's frightening because it may not come back. You know, if we do get a good water year, you know, the, is the land gonna come back up? Corcoran, the self-proclaimed farming capital of California. No coincidence, it's also the state's subsidence capital. For years, NASA has used satellites to measure how far the ground is sinking. The darker the color, the more the land has sunk. That dark purple area centered around Corcoran, all farm country. Some areas actually are sinking one to two feet a year. So, I mean, that's a, a huge amount. And the region's already feeling the effects. Groundwater hydrologist Michelle Sneed says this was a wet year and still the ground sank more than two and a half centimeters. That's still quite a bit. It, it, is, um, it is quite a bit when you're talking about, um, you know, the, the impact uh, to canals. Like this one, the Friant Kern Canal. It's a 250 kilometer long aqueduct that delivers water to 15,000 farms, but the system depends on gravity, and the ground has sunk so much in some spots, the water now has to travel uphill, basically turning the canal into a deep pool. It can only transmit about 40% of the water that it was designed to transmit. Subsidence doesn't just affect infrastructure like bridges, roads, and canals. It also reduces the ability of the earth itself to store water. And once that capacity is lost, experts say, you can't get it back. But the problems don't end there. In the tiny community of Allensworth, no one dares drink from the tap. Israel Sanchez spends about $200 a month on bottled water. This is what they, we had to go buying all the time in the town. And the, so the water that basically goes to your house here, yes. you, you can't drink that? No, no. That's because the water's dangerously polluted with arsenic. Subsidence is kind of like squeezing a sponge. The sinking ground presses contaminants like arsenic out of the soil and into the groundwater. 10% of wells tested in this agricultural hotspot have shown dangerous levels of arsenic. And just across from Sanchez's house, a cautionary tale. Historic Allensworth. In the early 1900s, a thriving African-American community. By the 1960s, an empty tourist attraction. One of the reasons this town was eventually abandoned, arsenic. More humans using the water, water not being replenished, and it, the concentrations are gonna get higher. They did deem the wells in the 60s as poisonous and undrinkable. With the added threat of drought due to climate change, experts say more needs to be done to curb water use right now, or the ground will keep sinking and the aquifers will keep shrinking. The farmers now are coming to terms with that and that they may have to pump less. There we go. But many farmers say that's not likely unless the state of California builds more reservoirs. Until then... Farmers have no choice but to pump it out of the ground. That or we don't grow crops. And people need to eat. You don't have to go far to look for proof. Just next door, her neighbor is digging a new well for his farm. It's big and it's deep. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, near Corcoran, California. Stay with us. We'll be right back with tonight's moment. Over the last month, Toronto construction workers have discovered nooses at several construction sites. The most recent was found on Friday. Old School General Store, one part community center, one part retail space, led the way in denouncing those racist acts, encouraging people to put up messages of love and support for the black community at one of the sites. And this is tonight's moment. As soon as we heard about this, we knew that we could not let this go unchallenged and that we had to speak up and immediately we organized an action where we as a community have gone and put up messages, signs, art 
on the construction site where construction workers walk in to show that we are in opposition to this hate crime, that we do not believe in the hatred, that black lives do matter, that a disgusting symbol of lynching will not go unnoticed. You know, we're calling it uh, art activism, so artivism, uh, that's gone up on the construction site. It's time. It's time for our country to deal with the racism that's embedded all around us. Kudos to Zara, uh, but also kudos to that whole community for taking what was a, a hateful, disgusting act and turning it into something that was there to bring the community together, a teachable moment. You see the kids there riding on their bikes, coming to, to learn and to understand. And uh, that's great, a great moment. And that is The National for tonight, June 28th. I'm David Common.